Hello everyone and welcome to the Weekend Recap. I'm your host, Padrian, and we're diving right into things via España. But first, don't forget, we have watch-alongs for you to join us for this week, so do not miss those. Barcelona went away to Deportivo Alaves after following up their 2-0 win over Juventus, and I was curious to see how Barcelona and Real Madrid would react after their differing fortunes midweek. For Barcelona, would that win over Juve bring them some of the confidence that perhaps players such as Griezmann need it? He looked promising at times against Juve, and he continued to build upon that performance in this match. He and Messi look as if they are starting to turn the corner as far as figuring out how to play with each other. Finally. <laughs> but as for the rest of Barcelona, bar maybe De Jong, who was tidy in midfield, it wasn't their most inspired performance. Alaves scored very much against the run of play an hour in. Clanger from Neto. Oof, just hoof that ball away first time or play a horizontal pass to Pique into the space he was running into. I mean, easier said than done, I know, but man, did that ever look bad. Do anything but that. With Jota getting sent off in the 62nd minute, that gave Barcelona the spark that perhaps they needed. And it was, of course, Antoine Griezmann with the finish in the 63rd minute, just a minute after the red card. A deflected pass fell kindly to him, but the finish was impressive as he just lifted it over the onrushing keeper. 1-1, that's all they can muster in this one, and Griezmann's words after the match about how the whole team is failing in front of goal couldn't have been more accurate. They're getting chance after chance, and they just can't finish. Real Madrid, a team that looked as if they were having problems with motivation in recent matches, or at the very least, they have been slow starters. And so in taking on Huesca, a team that going into this was winless in seven matches, there could be absolutely no excuses from Zidane's squad. Eden Hazard started his first match in ages, and for a return, he didn't look so bad at all. Scoring a howitzer of a left foot finish from way outside the box just five minutes before the break, Benzema doubled the lead on the stroke of halftime and later set up Fede Valverde to make it three. Valverde with some strong performances lately as he ended this match with a goal and an assist. Benzema scored his second of the match late as Real Madrid won 4-1 in this one. We'll see where they go from here. Huesca is far from a stern opponent, but they had a similarly slow start last season, so all we can do is wait and see in regard to Real Madrid. The return of Hazard is a major positive for their attack though. Sevilla are in an absolute slump domestically, but their performance midweek against Stade Rene was certainly an overall improvement. After 9 minutes however, Sevilla were 1-0 up with Moroccan striker Youssef Ennisiri scoring what has become a rare goal for Sevilla domestically that was just their sixth goal in as many matches for them against Athletic Bilbao. But beyond that point in the match and a flurry early in the second half, Sevilla once again lacked any sort of attacking verve, any sort of ability to put the match away. Their attack is really struggling these days and their airtight defense isn't shipping goals. But when you're only good for one goal per game, then you better have an airtight defense defense and it's not quite at that point is it because during a late push from the host Bilbao they equalized in the 76th minute via Iker Munyan a FIFA 14 legend and took the lead 86th minute thanks to Sunset 2-1 Bilbao three match losing skid for Sevilla Atletico Madrid have extended their unbeaten run to 22 matches now as they beat Osasuna 3-1 on Saturday never really needing to get out of second gear in this one it seems like João Felix has finally found himself. The most obvious thing pointing towards that being the fact that even when he's not at his glimmering, brilliant best, he's still putting in solid performances and getting involved along the way. The man could have potentially had a hat trick in this game at just a canter if he hadn't rung a penalty off of the bar just after the half, considering he had converted a penalty just before the half. Simeone played Felix and Correa as a front two in this one after they showed some great chemistry against Salzburg, and it was the Argentinian setting up Juan Felix second, and Atletico bookended a goal from Osasuna with a third by Lucas Torreira. Torreira looking like he's genuinely loving life at Atletico, and I mean, are we really surprised by that? He looks a Simeone player, and there could be no doubt he'd like the lifestyle and the weather more in the Spanish capital than in London. Three won the final there, but Atletico really could have scored four, five, maybe even six in this match. Cadiz cannot be stopped. Well, they can, and they have been on two occasions. <laughs> But Cadiz got there for the victory of the season against Ibar on Friday with an extremely competent 2-0 victory on the road. Alvaro Nagredo scored in the 36th minute and set up Salvi in the 39th for a quick 2-0 lead that the newly promoted side was able to hang on to despite the onslaught in the second half from Ibar. They're thriving thus far, but have a stern test in Atletico Madrid 
next Saturday. Speaking of tests, I challenge any team to beat Sociedad right now in this current form as they are just flying. Absolutely flying at the moment as they went away to Vigo and two goals per half were enough to see them come away with a 4-1 victory once again. They've had three 3-0 wins and two consecutive 4-1 victories. They're creatures of habit. David Silva got his first goal for the future champs, La Real, while Oyarzabal scored his fifth of the season and Willian Jose grabbed himself his first two of this campaign. Things are looking very, very good in San Sebastián for Imanol. And with that win, Sociedad are top of the league on 17 points, though they have played more matches than Real Madrid, Atletico, etc. Barcelona are down in mid-table and they too have matches in hand, but even having played one less than Real Madrid, they'd still be five points behind Real Madrid if they were to win that game. Again, it's early enough that it's not a massive worry, but they will be getting a bit nervous the longer that this goes on and the distance grows between them and the top teams. In Italy, Zlatan Ibrahimovic and AC Milan keep on rolling, though they did have a bit of a challenge in taking on Udinese on Sunday. Udinese, of course, are mixing it up in the basement of the Serie A, but they've shown in their last few matches that they are improving, at least on the offensive front. It was stunning, sexy strike from Franck Kessier. Adrian, why are you sexualizing the strike from Kessier? You know why. He smacked it off of the crossbar and in. Oof! What a hit from the man who has been one of Milan's top performers behind Zlatan. Zlatan being the one who actually set him up for it, of course. And as expected, Milan largely dominated the match, though Udinese certainly had some decent spells, one of which coming straight after the break in which Romagnoli clumsily gave away a penalty. 1-1 at that point, but Milan took over once again and in the 83rd minute, the 39-year-old Swede scored an acrobatic match winner, an overhead kick that one-hopped into the goal, 2-1 Milan, and they are yet to taste defeat after six matches now. Their rivals, Inter, are still struggling in the attack. Again, it's Groundhog Day for Inter fans and everyone who watches me talk about Inter as their side struggle in the attack and they're really, they really had it against them with Lukaku not being available. A man who, when he isn't scoring, is creating and occupying the minds of defenders to make space for his much, much, much less clinical teammates around him. Inter could have and frankly should have scored four or five goals in this one, but another stinker in the attack means that they had to come back from 2-0 down against Parma just to salvage a 2-2 draw in the 92nd minute, no less. They were on their way to a loss in this one. The one high point for Inter, I mean, finally a decent performance from Kolarov defensively, and once again, another solid performance from Barella, but in general, Inter's back line, beyond Kolarov, I should say, was not very inspiring, especially when they were facing Real Madrid midweek. That's scary going into that match. Juve and Spezia played on Sunday and following the news that Ronaldo was clear to return to action, that would have been a boost for his side. One guarantee for Juve, at least lately, has been Alvaro Morata scoring offside goals and in the first half, well, Murata actually went against the grain and scored a goal that actually stood. Great unselfish play from Weston McKenney, who was a definite top performer for Juve in the first hour or so of this one. Marata, however, couldn't help himself and later was denied for making it 2-0 for offside. <laughs> My god. He has been incredible since joining Juve, involved in most of the goals they've scored in some way or another, and his disallowed goals tally has got to be at 5 or maybe six or more at this point. Anyway, Ronaldo came on in the second half to try and change things and it took him exactly 126 seconds to do so as Morata played him through and he coolly rounded the keeper to make it 2-1. It's as if he never took a few weeks off thanks to COVID. Rabio came on as a sub as well and after four minutes he made it 3-1 and finally Ronaldo converted a penalty for 4-1. What a difference he made on the pitch. Juve back to winning after going winless in two matches. Paulo Dybala, man, another performance that was just uninspiring from him. Atalanta also got back to winning following a couple of losses as they beat Crotone 2-1 in the beautiful Mediterranean city from the south of Italy. Luis Muriel scored a first half brace, the first of which was set up by Melanovsky who put in a great performance. Muriel is sitting on four goals from five matches now in the Serie A and while Atalanta isn't scoring for fun domestically as they have in recent seasons, they dominated this match against Crotone everywhere but on the score sheet. <laughs> Lazio and Torino played out a seven goal thriller that saw Lazio 
take all three points in the end. What a watch this was. Lazio scored first, then Torino went 2-1 up just 10 minutes later. Milinkovic Savic equalized only for the final few minutes of the match to provide much, much, much drama. In the 87th minute, Sasa Lukic scored for Torino to put them 3-2 up. Job done, right? No. In the 93rd minute, Patrick won Lazio, the visitors, a penalty, from which Chiro made no mistake, 3-3. And in the 98th minute, Felipe Caicedo scored for Lazio to make it 4-3. What a roller coaster that was, man. Massive three points for Lazio as they look to stay on pace with the top teams. Sassuolo, like I said on Twitter, in saying that they have sort of been a Atalanta light in the last year or so, isn't too much of a stretch as their biggest Achilles heel was their defending in the past while well, going forward they were brilliant. However, this season, thus far, they have seemingly rectified that problem as they went away to Napoli this weekend and grabbed a 2-0 win. The scoreline doesn't paint the picture properly of just how close this match was, as Napoli thought they had an equalizer late on, though Manolas and Osimen were offside, while Andrea Consili was a very busy boy in Sassuolo's goal. By the way, what a goal from Maxime Lopez for Sassuolo in stoppage time, and Roberto's boys roll on. Also, we had Roma beating Fiorentina 2-0 as Pedro finished the match off in the second half with a stunning counter-attack, ending with the Spaniard tapping in his second of the season from a Mkhitaryan squared ball. A late surge from Fiorentina, but Roma hang on for the clean sheet and the win for Paulo Fonseca. And so in Italy, we have Milan on top, unbeaten thus far, Sassuolo right behind them as they boast the most potent attack in the league, and then we have Juve, Atalanta, Napoli, Inter and Roma all within touching distance, Lazio not too far off either. Another Bundesliga match day gone and Schalke are still without a win since they last tasted victory in January of 2020. It's been a long time coming, but there are some serious issues within that club. Issues that you will finally hear about when I finally get my Schalke explainer video out this week. I'm very excited for you guys to see it as I put a ton of effort into this one and the delay on it was worth it as I got a very special guest to help me out with this video. But yes, last Friday they at least didn't lose, but all they could muster was a draw against VFB Stuttgart whom, as you'll remember, are back in the Bundesliga after a season in the second division. Again, it was uninspiring stuff from Schalke who could have easily lost this one, but there are some ever so slight signs of improvement under Manuel Bohm. Mats Hummels. He scores when he wants, and he scored in two consecutive Bundesliga matches now. As Borussia Dortmund went away to Armenia Bielefeld, the veteran defender scored a brace in the second half to give Dortmund a 2-0 win. Now, 2-0 is a relatively comfortable scoreline, but Dortmund certainly did labor at times without Holland leading their line. All of the possession you could ever want in a match, plenty of strikes towards goal, and perhaps they were a bit unlucky for a few of their opportunities, but they really could have and should have scored five or six in this one. Regardless, a win is a win. They didn't concede and ultimately Favre will be happy. He won't be happy that Hummels went off injured, however, a thigh muscle strain according to transfer market. So we'll see how long that keeps him out. Eintracht Frankfurt seemingly started the season so strongly and here I thought they would march on to the kind of form that catapulted them into the, you know, the public consciousness during the 2018-19 season, that long run they went on. But Three matches without a win now has Adi Hutter's side looking like they will suffer the same fate as last season's Frankfurt side. Moments of brilliance, but these are largely overshadowed by plenty of lame performances. This weekend they drew 1-1 with Werder Bremen, a slow starting team that has an identical record to Frankfurt now, actually. Bayer Leverkusen are well beyond their early season laborious play as they have racked up three victories in a row now. Their latest victim was SC Freiburg, and despite starting poorly, with a goal conceded just three minutes in, they quickly grabbed hold of this match. In fact, it looked as if their job would get even harder, as Sven Bender was given a straight red, but thankfully for them, upon VAR reviewing it, it was rescinded and a yellow given instead. That really put a spark in their step, as Leverkusen rallied to score three unanswered goals. Final score, 4-2 Bayer Leverkusen. Extremely entertaining second half in that one. Bayern Munich went away to FC Köln and really had to labor against the side that hasn't won a Bundesliga match since March 6th of this year. That's going on 14 matches prior to this match, and 15 after this match. It's unfortunate for them because they were in such hot form prior to the COVID break. Oh well. And yes, I have a soft spot for Colton. <laughs> Bayern dominated the middle portion of this match with Muller converting a penalty and Gnabry scoring a nice individual goal. Great work from Kimmich on that one, however. 
Cold surge late, getting a goal through Drexler, but it wasn't enough. 2-1 Bayern, a good match for them to rest some key players in. And finally, Marco Rosa's Midas touch continues for Gladbach as they hosted the league-leading RB Leipzig, and with their spirits low, following that trouncing from United, they found very little joy against Gladbach. Leipzig didn't really come into this match until they were a goal down, as Jonas Hoffmann bossed the match, and Hans Wolf, who looked so poor against Real Madrid when he came on, scored what was the winning goal for Gladbach after 60 minutes. 1-0 the final, Leipzig's first loss of the Bundesliga season. And it has cost them the lead in the league. The Bundesliga looks very familiar now, as Bayern topped the table with Dortmund on equal points as them, Leipzig have dropped to third, and Leverkusen, Gladbach, Augsburg et al. are all circling like sharks. Next weekend is Der Klassiker, by the way, Dortmund versus Bayern Munich from Signal Iduna Park. And we'll also get to take in Leverkusen hosting Gladbach. That should be a great match as well. Chelsea's season has been a bit of a balancing act, hasn't it? It was no secret they would concede goals, just as goals were expected of them going forward. But after their attack was flying, Lampard had to adjust the defensive side of things a bit. And now, perhaps, we're starting to see the true representation of Lampard's Chelsea, just a bit more. With Hakim Ziyech in their lineup, who scored for the second match running and provided an assist as well, their attack is firing again. After two matches without a goal scored, that's prior to their win midweek against Krasnodar. But almost more importantly for them, Edward Mendy has been the answer to their goalkeeping needs, as all Rabona TV subscribers will have known for a while now, of course, right? Not only has Chelsea been undefeated with the tall Senegalese keeper between the posts, but he now has five consecutive clean sheets. What a difference that makes for a team. Now, of course, against Burnley, he didn't have a save to make, but as we always talk about here, it's the psychological effect that a good keeper has on the defenders in front of them, which is completely reversed when they have an error-prone or erratic keeper behind them. Chelsea really taking shape now. Liverpool, despite their injury crisis, were able to take down the hottest manager in the league currently, David Moyazinho, and his rollicking West Ham that have taken no prisoners thus far. It wasn't easy for Liverpool, as West Ham took an early lead as Joe Gomez's clearance fell right at the feet of Fornells at the edge of the box and he tapped it off the post and in easy 1-0 West Ham at that point. But just before the second half, Salah was taken down and made no mistake from the spot. Liverpool were 1-1 at that point and were looking flat until that point. But they picked it up as the match went on and in three matches in a row at Anfield, Diogo Jota has scored once again. Well, he scored twice actually, but one was called back. <laughs> the first player to score in three consecutive appearances at Anfield in 15 years, for Liverpool that is, and he has become an instant hit for Liverpool. But I mean, was there ever any doubt given what he accomplished at Wolves? Two on the final there, another win for Liverpool, and give more credit to Shakiri for the beautiful through ball for the winner. Man City played away to Sheffield, and I'm starting to feel very badly for the Blades. Based on some of their performances so far, the points they've managed to accumulate don't make sense to me, with just one to their name. Against City, they look decent once again, testing City's defense, which to be fair to City, their defense had an answer to everything. And while City's defense was rock solid, limiting Sheffield United to just three attempts and only one troubling Ederson, their offense did labor a little bit, as the front three of Torres, Mares, and Sterling had difficulty carving out genuine chances, or at least finishing them off. Walker with the winner against his beloved club, 1-0 win, job done City. Southampton really are them boys this season, aren't they? They stormed to a 4-0 lead away to Aston Villa this weekend, and while things got a little hairy at the end, with Villa pulling it back to 4-3, a big win like this, coupled with all of their successes lately, really does shine a light once again on how impressive this team and their manager Ralph Hasenhutl are. They're currently mixing it up near the top of the table, and since football returned in England in June, they have the third best record of all teams in the league. This despite losing an important player like Horbier. By the way, Wolves are also killing it as Nuno's team won 2-0 at home against Crystal Palace this weekend. They got the job done early with Nori scoring in the 18th and Daniel Plodence doubling the lead 10 minutes later. Nice assist from his countryman Pedro Neto. They had to endure some scary moments from the visitors, but their defense dealt with Palace well. Most notably, Nelson Semedo who had one of his best performances in the gold. Wolves. Newcastle United got a big victory over Carlo Ancelotti's Everton. 
who find themselves slumping a bit in the last few matches. After such an exciting start to the season, they had everyone's tongues wagging about them being title challengers, but that draw that was almost a loss against Liverpool, followed by a loss against Southampton, and now a loss against Newcastle, it's not been a great run, at least in comparison to the start of the season. Now, they can always bounce back, of course, just as they almost did in this match against Newcastle when they were 2-0 down. And you'd expect a manager of Ancelotti's ability to be able to do so, or maybe not. Didn't do so well last season, so we'll see how things go this season, but I mean, I still have belief in this team. Tottenham truly labored against Brighton. They were given a weird penalty to take the lead. Another foul that was just on the line of the 18, a la McBurney versus Liverpool. But then Brighton scored a goal from which it looked like there was a clear foul in the lead up, so at least the refereeing was consistently weird. But anyway, Gareth Bale came on and won the match for Tottenham as the man that idolizes him, Sergio Reguilon, set him up. 2-1 Tottenham, and Brighton is another one of those teams whose point total doesn't live up to their general play, to their performances. They're an unlucky team. And finally, I will no longer try to predict when United has turned a corner or not because just as Peter Drury said during the broadcast of their match at home against Arsenal, just when all these United take one step forward, they seem to take one back. For me, it's more like 1.25 steps forward and one step back. But hey, that's splitting hairs here. It's not as if Arsenal provided a lot going forward in this match, as United largely dominated the ball, but to be honest, neither team provided much of anything going forward. It was a midfield battle, not the most engaging of matches, and Arsenal got the winner thanks to a Paul Pogba blunder in which he bundled into Bayerin in the box to concede a penalty that Aubameyang converted, a man who has been starved for goals. As Oli said, United never really showed up, and despite the changes he made, they never really came close to equalizing besides, you know, a Van de Beek attempt that bounced off of Gabriel, off of Leno's forehead, and off of the post. 1-0 Arsenal there, their first win at Old Trafford in the Premier League in 14 years. And so the table, my friends. Liverpool are top of the table with 16 points, while Spurs, yes, the highest scoring team in the league, Spurs are in second place at the moment. Everton's still hanging around, and I expect Chelsea to start climbing up the table now. To find United, you have to go to the bottom half as their domestic woes continued. They sit in 15th with 7 points, but they do have a match in hand. Hey, thanks so much for watching. I appreciate you. And don't forget to join us for the watch-alongs this week. My name is Padrian. This is Rabona TV's Weekend Recap, and we'll catch you next time. Ciao!